Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Shoals Marine Laboratory Weekly Marine Science Seminar. I'm Dr. Jennifer Seavey, the Executive Director at Shoals. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with us, Shoals is the largest and the oldest undergraduate focused marine lab in the country and is jointly operated by Cornell and University of New Hampshire. And we are located uh, 10 miles offshore of Portsmouth in the Isles of Shoals. Every summer, we offer our entire uh, community weekly rock talks, as we call them on these, this rocky island of Appledore. And we are excited to be continuing these uh, rock talks over Zoom so that our off island community can join us as well. So, as usual, our format is 45 minutes of speaking followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen and type it in. And I will uh, read them to Dr. David at the end and you'll get your questions then. So, but you can put them in there at any time and they'll be there and I'll get to them at the end of the talk. If you have any technical problems, put it in there too. And, and Colin and I uh, will help solve problems. So. So our speaker tonight, I'm really excited to have with us is Dr. Andrew David. He is an assistant professor of biology at Clarkson University in New York. He has an undergraduate in biology from St. John's University in uh, Queens, New York, a master's from Hofstra on Long Island, also in New York. And he did a PhD in zoology at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. We were just talking about it. it. Sounded like an amazing experience. And he is a marine invertebrate zoologist whose research is centered on understanding the dynamics of aquatic invasions, specifically by tracking the spread of invasive species using ecological and molecular techniques, along with biophysical modeling. He has worked around the world, as I just implied there, with aquatic managers and farmers to deal with invasive pests. So tonight he's going to talk to us about riverscape and seascape genetics as tools for understanding dispersal of aquatic invasive species. Thank you so much for joining us, Drew, and uh, take it away. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see. All right, so um, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me to give this talk. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is just some of the research that my lab has been doing for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, with, which really tries to understand how aquatic invasive species move across a seascape or move across a riverscape. Because my lab tends to do a lot of work in the marine realm and also in the freshwater realm. Um, so just to give you guys a background in terms of uh, you know what type of research I do before I get into some uh, uh, population genetic stuff. Um, so my lab is focused on a couple of different projects right now. And one of the or the overarching theme of all of these projects is invasive species. Um, so one project that we've been doing over, this was probably started in 2018, is using DNA barcoding and metabarcoding to try to investigate what type of invasive species are present in the Adirondack Mountains. And I'll talk more about the Adirondacks later on, but for those of you who don't know, the Adirondack region is um, a very big part of northern New York. In fact, it's the largest protected forested reserve in the contiguous United States. And not a lot is known about its invertebrate fauna, surprisingly. Um, when I started going out with my students and I went out hiking when I first came to Clarkson, I noticed that almost every mollusk, or more specifically every gastropod that we recovered, were non-indigenous. And so that had me thinking and that had my students thinking, why is that? And that led us into some other projects. So one project we've been doing is looking at the effects of climate change stresses on invasive freshwater gastropods. So we've been taking snails, aquatic snails, and we have been rupturing the shells. Um, 
And then we have been culturing those snails under carbon dioxide and reduced acidification. And we've been trying to figure out um, how quickly does it regenerate its shell and is the structural integrity of the shell the same as those, let's say, that were ruptured in a control treatment. Um, and we've been getting some really interested, um, interesting results from that. Now, something that's closer to you folks is uh, my work on invasive polychaetes. So a lot of my work right now is focused on mollusks, but polychaetes are basically what I made my career over. I love polychaetes. I think they're probably the most interesting of all marine invertebrates. And my background has been working on invasive polychaetes in the New England coast. And so every summer we have the New England Rapid Assessment Survey which is um, funded by the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. And we bring taxonomists from everywhere, um, people that focus on algae, people that focus on crabs. I'm in charge of all the polychaete stuff, and we try to um, figure out whether or not there's any new records of polychaetes or whether or not invasive polychaetes have expanded their range over the last year or two years. Now, the project that I'm going to be talking about today involves genetic connectivity and it involves using the tools like particle tracking models and population genetics to understand how invasive populations are connected across seascapes and across riverscapes. And this project is actually my favorite of all four because first of all it was the project that my PhD was based on and it was the project that, that actually garnered a lot of attention um, with my collaborators and, you know, other people that I work with. So, for those of you who, who may or may not know, um, I'm sure a lot of you already know what biological invasions are. It's been talked about a lot. You've heard about the zebra mussels, you've heard about the invasive lionfish. Um, in the New England coast, we have invasive tunicates, right? So, the invasion process is a relatively um, complex dynamic process, but we can distill it down to four major steps. So the first step for you to actually have an invasion is you need to have a species transported from its native or its endemic range into a range where it typically does not occur. And this can occur via vectors. And there are a bunch of different vectors that are responsible for um, transporting marine organisms and freshwater. Right. For marine organisms, we have ballast water where ships take in large volumes of water at one dock. They move over to another dock, they dump their ballast, and in doing so, they dump all the organisms that were brought in. Um, how fowling, so barnacles, encrusting organisms, they can often attach to the hulls of ship, ships. And, you know, that's one way they can be transported to new areas. And then aquaculture, which is actually the a very key part of my talk because um, the aquaculture trade, specifically the trade in oysters, has been implicated in um, some of the most interesting invasion events. Because if you ever looked at an oyster, the way its shell is shaped, there are a lot of grooves and nooks and crannies where tiny little shrimps and algae and worms can get stuck in. And when they move those oysters around, you inadvertently move um, their symbiotes. Right? So once transportation has occurred, the species must now be introduced um, and become established. So if it survived transportation, it needs to be lucky enough that it lands in an area where the water temperature is right, where the pH is right. So abiotic factors need to be favorable. Um, what a lot of other researchers have also proposed is that you need to have ample propagule pressure, meaning that you need to have a consistent um, flow of new migrants so that if something weird happens at the original population crash, then there is those that might supplement um, the population that declined. And so once you have your species becoming established and forming what we call a point source, now it needs to be able to spread into new areas. And depending on what the species is, if it uses larvae, the larvae need to be able to move into a new area and establish. 
that might depend on currents, patterns. So if the species gets dropped in an area where there is a lot of high current flow, um, then your chances of spreading naturally is going to be very, very low. And so if you're an invasion biologist, you might study all of these different steps or particular steps or focus on particular steps. My research actually is focused on what happens in between establishment and spread. Because once a species becomes established and spreads, for that species to maintain its existence in that new area, population connectivity is a very, very important feature that has to be studied. Um, because connected populations allow for the long-term um, survivorship of an invasive species. So to give you an idea why connectivity is so important, here I have two scenarios, right? So I have scenario one, where we have this large point source, I call X, and then you have all of these satellite populations, and they're all disconnected from each other. Right? In the second scenario, I have point source X, but I have all of these satellite populations that are connected meaning that you have migrants that can move from the larger point source and form sink populations and move all the way back. So you have gene flow occurring among all of your populations. Now, if you are a conservation biologist and you're trying to conserve a endangered species, you want to promote the second scenario, right? Because in the first scenario, the problem is that all of these disconnected satellite populations are at danger of being extirpated or going extinct. And the reason why is because if you have a natural disaster, you have a bottleneck, what can happen is that the population will decline. You might have inbreeding depression. You can have you know, genetic drift, shifting alleles in certain directions. And so the chances of those small populations actually being able to maintain itself without any migrants from the outside is very, very low. Now, if you're an invasion biologist, you can flip that a bit. So you would actually want to promote this scenario because by promoting this scenario, by cutting off these satellite populations, you actually have a starting point from which you can start managing an invasive species, right? So by identifying genetically isolated populations, you can turn them into what we call management units. And then that's where your time and energy can go into in terms of eradicating the species. Now, this is a strategy that works sort of as the last resort, right? Ideally, you want to prevent a non-indigenous species from getting into the new area to begin with. But if an inv invasive species is already established, you know, this is where connectivity becomes important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys two scenarios of two different projects. One project is sort of has been going on since the end of my PhD up until 2018. And we're actually still doing some work with it. And the other one is something that my PhD student has been doing over the last six or seven months that I actually haven't presented yet. Um, so as um, was mentioned at the beginning. I did my PhD in South Africa. Um, I went to South Africa in 2012, and uh, I spent a couple of years there. And the reason why I came to South Africa is because there was a lot of problems with um, shell boring polychaetes. So these polychaetes are worms, and some of these worms can actually burrow into the shells of oysters. And if you're an oyster farmer, or an abalone farmer, or a scallop farmer, you do not want that um, on your farms, or else the shells are going to become brittle, the animals are going to die off. You know, it's basically a complete disaster if an aquaculture farm is infested by these worms. Now, before I get into the problem um, of these shell boring worms, I just want to give you guys an overview of what the South African coast looks like because it's going to be important when I start talking about connectivity and um, I start talking about the particle tracking models that we use. So this is a South African coast. It's very big. Um, it's a, more than 2,000 kilometers in length. And it flanks 
a bunch of different countries. You have Namibia over here, and you have um, Mozambique over here. Right? And there are two dominating current systems. The first one is called the Benguela current. So it's a very cold northward flowing current that um, flows relatively slowly on the Atlantic Ocean. And then you have the larger, well, not larger, but faster and warmer, a gullus current that flows south on the Indian Ocean. Now, what's really interesting here is that South Africa is located at the very tip of the African continent. And right around here, the continental shelf actually widens. And that causes this agullus current to flip on itself, or what we call retroflex. So this retroflexion event is actually well studied among oceanographers. It's sort of like a really cool thing that happens in terms of ocean currents, because once that retroflexion occurs, it occurs so quickly that it, when it whips back, it causes these eddies to break off of the retroflexion, and it brings warmer waters from the Indian Ocean up into the Atlantic Ocean. And those eddies actually make their way all the way north into Europe, and it actually helps mediate the climate of Europe, which is really cool, right? So these red arrows that I, I've put here actually represent dispersal barriers. So because the South African coast is so interesting in terms of oceanographic features, a lot of researchers have studied the population genetics of different animals on this coastal system. And they've all identified four major barriers. You have what is called the Cape Point barrier, right? And you have these three other barriers that are dispersed around the coast. In fact, Cape Point is this picture that's in the background right here, right? It's a really cool part of South Africa. You can actually go all the way to the tip and it separates the Atlantic from the Indian and Southern Ocean. And it's a really um, important dispersal barrier. So, to put all of this into context, I'm just going to play this short animation, right? So the red refers to, well, warm water. So you can see the warm agullus current going south, and you can see the retroflexion over here, and these eddies are breaking off and bringing warm water into the Atlantic, right? So um, one of the really uh, lucrative industries in South Africa is their aquaculture industry, their fisheries. And shellfish aquaculture in particular is um, well represented on all of the coastal regions. Um, the two most commercially important shellfish um, is uh, Haliotis midi, which is the abalone, and Chrysostria gigas, which is your Pacific oyster. Now, Chrysostria gigas in South Africa, um, it's been farmed and it's consumed in the country. Haliotis mide is actually a luxury item, um, and most of it is actually exported um, to Taiwan and China and things like that. But both of these shellfish are, tend to be infested by um, shell boring polychaetes. So, what you're seeing here is a scallop, and this is not from South Africa, by the way. This was a scallop that I sampled on Nantucket a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I was over in Massachusetts back in May doing some um, sampling at their shellfish uh, farms. And this really black thing you see on the inside of the shell is called a mud blister. So whenever these worms burrow into the shell, the animals, sort of oyster or the scallop, in order to sort of um, seal that burrow up, it actually produces a mud blister. And the problem with these worms is that if the animal is infected by three or four worms, that's fine. But if you have really heavy infestations, which I'll show you what it looks like in a bit, then what's going to happen is that the oyster or the shellfish is going to be spending most of its energy trying to repair its shell rather than growing. And so the growth rate is going to decline. Also, the shells actually become very, very brittle under heavy infestations, right? So these all show mud blisters. And um, the circle I'm showing here shows a worm 
that so we cracked open the inner side of the shell so you can see the nutrient layer and these are what the worms look like so these are all three different species of um, shell boring worms the one i'm going to focus on here is a species called polydora hoplura it's actually an invasive species to south africa and it's been responsible for most of the shell boring act activities in that country so this video here and for those of you who love oysters i apologize in advance um, but this is a oyster, Chrysostria gigas, that's been placed in a 1% phenol solution. So the phenol solution acts as what we call a vermifuge. And basically, any worms that are in the shell become agitated and they actually begin to leave the shell. So this was a single oyster that we put in. And you can see the worm sort of squirming out. Um, there were about 200 to 275 worms in this single oyster, which was the most I've ever seen, right? So if you're eating oysters from the shell, you don't know if there's worms in there because no one cracks the shell, right? You eat the gonads and stuff that's in it. But that was the problem that the South African industry had to deal with. And so part of my PhD, first of all, was trying to figure out, okay, um, can we eradicate this species from the South African coast? To do that, we knew nothing about the biology of this worm. So first of all, we had to spend a year studying the worm, trying to figure out what its reproductive biology is. And then what we had to do is we had to sample populations from all across the coast and try to figure out, okay, what is the, what is the genetic landscape or seascape of this species look like? Are there, are, is the species being isolated by these barriers that I just mentioned? Or, you know, are the larvae, larvae able to disperse to new areas and maintain connectivity? And so one of the trick or one of the challenges of this project was that shell boring polychaetes are what we call obligate symbionts. So this means that if you take them out of their shell, they're gonna die, right? You can't just take them out and put them in a petri dish and have them, you know, reproduce and feed and culture them. And so the first thing we needed to do was we needed to figure out how do we culture these obligate borers, right? We clearly can't see what's happening in the shell. And so what we decided to do was we use these one to 1.5 millimeter glass capillary tubes. And we tried to trick the worm into thinking that it was in its burrow in the shell when it's really in a glass tube. Nine out of 10 times when we first did the preliminary work, the worm died, right? So we would try to tease the worm into the tube and then the worm would squirm in. We would get pretty excited, then it would come through the other end and then die. So that sucked. But eventually we started getting it right. We started figuring out if you relax the womb with magnesium chloride, then it's less likely to get agitated. And so eventually we were able to get enough wombs into these glass capillary tubes. And if it was a female and she had mated, she would actually produce her egg strips in it. And so you could take these tubes and put it under a microscope and you could actually observe larval development um, from eggs all the way to um, the end marble stage, right? So we were actually able to, you know, observe multiple females brooding. We were able to record larval size, larval size at hatching. We were able to develop a protocol for figuring out which algae would best to feed them. And so we actually cultured these worms for months using this uh, protocol. And so we were able to figure out that this worm produces plantotrophic larvae which spends about 40 to 50 days at the plankton before it settles, and also produces a delphophagic larvae, which are much bigger at hatching because they feed on nurse eggs, and they settle within a couple of days. So it can produce long-lived larvae and short-lived larvae at, in the same individual. So that's a rare form of larval development that's only found in probably seven or eight different species out there. And so once we figured out um, 
the larval biology of this worm. That took about a year, year and a half. Now it was time to actually find populations across the South African coast and try to figure out, you know, how connected are these populations? Are there any isolated groups that we can sort of target to start getting rid of or start managing? And so to do this, we sampled the entire South African coast. This took us a year because it's a long coast. And, you know, sometimes you go to a site, it's a bus, there are no worms. And so sometimes you might have to go offshore to get them. And eventually we got about uh, seven populations. So these are just some photos from those um, sunny days in South Africa where we would you know, go out and you know find as many oysters, barnacles, whatever had a calcium carbonate shell and could potentially harbor worms. We collected it, um, cracked open the shell, got the worms, I need it, and um, stored it for genetic studies. So I just want to put these breaks again here, these dispersal barriers, so you remember where they are, because it's going to be important when we uh, look at the genetics. But these were all the sites that we sampled. Um, and by the way, each of these sites happened to have an oyster or an abalone farm within a couple of miles from it, from the actual sampling location. So, you know, long story short, we um, did the, all of the genetic work. Uh, we focused on using a mitochondrial and nuclear markers for this. Um, and these are what the haplotype net network looks like. So the coloration patterns or the colors gives you the particular sites. Um, this, each circle represents a haplotype. And for those of you who don't know what a haplotype is, a haplotype you can think of as a signature within the genome. So if two individuals share the same haplotype, it means that at some point in their evolutionary history, there was interbreeding, whether or not it was between their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, right? And so what this shows is that we have a very mixed network, right? So for example, we have this single large haplotype here being shared by individuals from four different sites that span two different phylogeographic variants. Right? And the nuclear data set, you know, you have this one haplotype where almost, I think, basically all the individuals share that same haplotype. So in other words, we have a highly connected population based on the population genetics. When we looked at our FST values, and FST refers to, it's a measure of population genetic differentiation, and it's actually an indirect measure. And basically, your FST values can range from zero to one. An FST value of zero means that everyone is mated with everyone, right? You have high levels of gene flow. There is no structure. One means that all of the populations are showing structure. In fact, it might not even be the same species. You might be dealing with cryptic species. And so 0, 0.0 to 0 0.04 is actually very, very low. So this sort of corroborated our haplotype network that shows, hey, these populations of worms are actually exhibiting high levels of connectivity or a lot of gene flow. Now, once we completed this study, and this took probably a year to complete in terms of the sampling, the genetic work, the analysis, we actually presented this at a conference. And there was this one, uh, German researcher who was working on the South African coast for decades. And I always like telling this story because it gives you an idea that um, there's always more to do. So when I finished my presentation, I remember that he told me that um, he found it very difficult to accept the fact that this polyhedron worm was exhibiting high levels of genetic connectivity, also known as panmixia, across the South African coast. And the reason why he was skeptical was that if you go into the literature on the South African coast and you look at all of the species that's been studied in terms of their population genetics, we've studied octopus, mussels, rock lobsters, seahorses, all of these species show genetic disjunction at Cape Point. Right? So his 
argument was that why is it that these all of these individuals are showing genetic disjunction, but these tiny worms that produce small larvae that could be moved about by ocean currents are able to traverse this barrier. Something has to be wrong. So he assumed that maybe, you know, I needed more high resolution markers like RADSeq or microsatellites, and maybe that would help. And so I didn't want to actually go back into the genetic data, and I did, definitely did not want to design microsatellite markers for my species. And so I was lucky enough that I had a colleague at the time he was at the University of Cape Town, which is another university in South Africa. Um, he was a postdoc coming in from England, and he was actually in the process of building the first ever high resolution oceanographic model of the South African coast. So he's basically an oceanographer. And um, what he proposed was that, why don't we sort of combine forces? Right? He had just created this really cool model and um, he needed a actual real life example to validate it. And I, on the other hand, had this really weird genetic pattern and I was trying to validate it using physical modeling. And so what we did was we decided to um, retrofit our um, oceanographic model with a particle tracking model. So this, you know, weird looking chart over here, this flow diagram is the framework for the regional ocean modeling system or ROMS. So this is a primitive equation ocean model. And I mean very, very primitive. Um, it, to build this model, we use Fortran, which is a very old programming language that, you know, I've been told people don't use anymore. I mean, I use Python, and when I first saw Fortran, I was very confused. But, you know, we retrofitted the model, we basically combined it with a Lagrangian particle tracking model, and we decided to simulate larval dispersal on the South African coast, and then compare the connectivity we got through the particle tracking model with the genetics. So we overlaid both of them to try to figure out what exactly is going on. So the way that we did this is that we dropped about just over 1,200 quote unquote larvae at three different sites. And we were very cognizant of this Cape Point barrier. So we dropped a couple of larvae at Jacobs Bay, which is over here. We dropped a couple at Hermanus, which is just south of that dispersal barrier. And then we dropped a couple very far to the east um, in our Indian Ocean site. And so we simulated larval dispersal for 10 years because we had about, well, nine or 10 years. We had about 10 years worth of oceanographic data. And in the end, we recovered about just over a quarter million trajectories. And what was really surprising is that it stood in stark contrast to our genetic data. Right, so our genetic data said that this Cape Point barrier was not an actual barrier for our species. Yet, what our oceanographic data is showing is the complete opposite. All of the larvae that was released from Jacobs Bay moved north, and those that moved south never actually got beyond Cape Point. Right, most of them were caught up in the eddies and swung back north. When we looked at the site south of the barrier, again, everything moved north. And then when we looked at the far eastern site, a lot of them were caught up in the retroflexion. A few of them connected to the west, but most of them eventually went offshore or settled very close to the um, east coast sites. To, to sort of corroborate that, what we did was we looked at um, percentage capture. So how many of the larvae actually settled in that particular area? So this is eastern to western localities. So we're moving from um, should be working right. So we're moving basically from east to west, and we had less than fifty percent particle capture for all of those sites. When we looked at west to east, then we didn't have anything. 
right? So none of the larvae were actually able to connect to eastern localities when they were released from the western sites. And so now we were in a conundrum. So something was happening that was, you know, our genetic data was telling us, hey, this is a highly connecting head of population. And our physical modeling was telling us, no, um, these larvae should not be able to cross Cape Point. Um, we eventually figured out what happened. Um, and we, we coined a term called cryptic dispersal. And what happened was that when we interviewed a lot of these oyster farmers and these abalone farmers, apparently what they were doing and what they weren't supposed to do is they would move or sell some of their excess oyster and abalone stock to other farms in other parts of the country, in other biogeographic regions. And because we know that all of these farms have infested shellfish, when you move the shellfish, you also move the parasites with them. You also move the shell boring worms. And so let's say you move shellfish from farm A to farm B, those worms are gonna reproduce. They're going to release their larvae. And then the larvae is gonna be able to move into the wild because the water is pumped into the farm and then water is pumped out of the farm. And once they get out, they can interbreed with the local populations. And if this movement is occurring frequently enough, you can actually dilute your phylogeographic signal to the point where it appears as though you have a well-mixed population naturally. But in fact, it's humans. It's, it's basically human mediated movement that's driving gene growth. And so what we think was happening was that, and we, had, we eventually figured this out because one of my lab mates who was a master's student was actually doing some genetic work on the farms and comparing data with what was found in the wild. And you know what we figured out is that by adding the physical modeling aspect, that acted as a control for natural movement. And we wouldn't have figured that out if we just used genetic data. And so regardless of whether or not we were using microsatellite genetic markers or even the cool new rad seat markers, it wouldn't have made a difference. Um, and so this is sort of a, I would like to say that this is sort of a evidence that, you know, if you're doing, you know, connectivity, it's very good to do this from a oceanographic and a genetic point of view. And that's partly because we're living in a time where stuff is being moved about a lot, right? And we've heard of that all of the time. So this is a 2015 um, global shipping density map that sort of gives you an idea of how noisy the ocean is, right? Um, the red spots are basically where there's a lot of um, port activities and uh, shipping activities. And, you know, one of the questions that I, me and my colleagues asked ourselves when we published this was, you know, if, you know, all of the population genetic studies that's being done, whenever people promote panmixia, or when they claim panmixia, or highly connected populations, is it because of natural movement or is it because of anthropogenic movement? And that's really important to understand because, you know, one of the things that uh, people have been worried about for a long time is biotic homogenization. Because once you dilute those barriers and you move populations back and forth, you will have a well-mixed metapopulation and you actually lose some genetic diversity. And that has a lot of uh, implications for, you know, weakening adaptation and all of those different um, concepts. Right. So that was the work that I did in um, South Africa. And the work we're doing right now is actually very, very similar to that, except we've moved from the marine realm to the um, freshwater realm, which is sort of new territory for me. Um, so this is called a GLB Connect project. Um, and so we're working with the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Great Lakes Research Consortium to actually look at connectivity of invasive snails in New York's Great Lakes Basin, right? So the really picturesque lake you're seeing here is Kappa Lake. It's about 30 minute drive from where I am right now. There's like tons of tourists right now because it's sort of in season. 
Um, but to give you an idea of the New York Great Lakes Basin, um, this is includes Lake Ontario, which is Canada over here, Lake Erie, and all of the rivers that lead into Western New York and Northern New York. So I'm actually located in the Adirondack Park. And for those of you who don't know where that is, that's about a seven hour drive north of New York City. Um, there are more than 10,000 lakes in the region, uh, more than 30,000 miles of rivers. It's actually one of the most, um, it's one of the largest protected freshwater reserves in, in the United States. And when I first started working in the Adirondack Park, as I mentioned earlier, I started noticing that almost all of the mollusks that we found were invasive or non-indigenous. So you have the New Zealand mud snail over here. You can see a bunch of them on the rock. The key is there besides. You have, of course, the zebra mussels because we're so close to the Great Lakes. You have the Chinese mystery snail or the Japanese mystery snail that look very similar. And then you have the banded mystery snail over here, which is native to the southern United States. Now, what we focused on are these two species because not much is known about their demography um, in their invasive ranges. And also the Chinese mystery snail is known to harbor parasites that might be problematic. In fact, they're parasites of humans. And the banded mystery snail is a predator of largemouth bass eggs. And so because of their impacts, we're actually trying to study the connectivity of both of these species on the Great Lakes Basin using a similar strategy where we combine population with genetics with hydrodynamic modeling. And so the person who is actually um, spearheading this project is my uh, PhD student, Namanti. So since May, she has been, you know, all over the Adirondacks, all over Northern New York, basically trying to get as many samples as possible because, you know, as you guys probably know in Maine, the lakes and rivers freeze up. And so we have a very small window in which we can get our sampling done. Um, and so she's been sampling along the Racket River over here, which is actually the second longest river in New York State. And it's actually the most dammed river east of the Mississippi. So we have more than 27 electrical, hydroelectrical dams. And if you see where I'm going here, these dams can act as dispersal barriers or should act as dispersal barriers. And so what we're doing right now, besides sampling, is we're trying to um, design some microsatellite genetic markers for both of these species. And you know, we're going to be testing a couple of hypotheses. So for example, are these hydroelectric dams um, preventing the dispersal of these snails? And the question becomes complicated because in addition to dams, during the summer months, as I mentioned, it's a very big tourist destination. And so we have boaters coming all the way from Florida, coming into the Adirondacks and coming into the lakes and stuff. We have boaters from Canada coming into the Great Lakes, getting into the St. Lawrence River, and even making their way up to New York. And so if you come to the Adirondacks, you'll see a bunch of signs at all of the boat launches that says, you must clean your boats before you take it out. And so we know that these boats are acting as vectors. And so trying to see the interplay between, you know, boats as vectors, dams as dispersal barriers, and trying to figure out, you know, what is the pattern, what are the pattern we can expect? It's, it's sort of something that we're really interested in. And by and we already have models made, hydrodynamic models made of this region. And so it's going to be an interesting project over the next couple of years to see. Um, what comes out of it. And so this is sort of my shameless advertising for those of you who are interested in this type of research. Um, here at Clarkson, we actually have a RU program um, that started this summer. It's actually almost finished. And uh, we're having it for another year next summer. And so it's called the Aquatic Sciences Engineering and Technology um, program. It's directed by me and my colleague, Alan Christian is actually a muscle biologist. So he works on freshwater stuff. If you're interested in connectivity research, uh, and you're interested in doing hydrodynamic modeling and riverscape genetics, um, 
definitely get in contact with me. Um, this is our Twitter, Parks and RU. You can follow it. Um, but we do hope to continue this connectivity project in the next couple of years also. And so in terms of acknowledgement, um, Clarkson University is a, we have a lot of graduate programs, but our undergraduate students also help push a lot of our projects forward. In fact, um, we have an army of undergrads in my lab that have been responsible for many of the sampling, many of the counting of snails, all the DNA and metabarcoding, they were all done by undergrads. And so um, they definitely have to be acknowledged before everyone else. And um, I have a lot of collaborators, again, my contacts in South Africa, um, the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management were also important for some of the studies. And I have graduate students who've been working on this project over the last two years, especially the Riverscape ones. And um, funding is from state, federal, um, nonprofits. Uh, they've all contributed to this research um, in one way or another. So thank you for listening. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions. That's true. I learned a lot and I, you're a rare scientist who jumps between salt and fresh water and it's very cool. Um, I will invite people to, to ask their questions in the Q&A and I have a couple of questions because I studied oysters for a long time and I am intrigued by what you think about polychaetes in the Eastern oyster and climate change. Yeah, so, you know, we actually, we actually just published a review paper two days ago on that. Um, oh, wow. so climate change and shell boring polychaetes and the need for more experimental research. Yeah, we don't know. Um, it, it's, it, there's a lot of different scenarios that could be at play, right? I mean, there is wood that shows that, you know, elevated water temperatures and more acidic conditions can actually, uh, you know, benefit of polychaetes, depending on the species, but there hasn't been anything done on the shell boring worms, really, except the temperature of it. And what we do know is that when you increase the temperature, um, it actually messes with their, the amount of plantotrophic larvae versus adult pigeon that they produce. And so um, for that species that I just mentioned there, Polydora hoplura, we actually did temperature studies um, as part of my thesis, and we found that, you know, they do really well. They have a broad film of tolerance. They can survive as low as 12 degrees and as high as 24, and they have zero mortality. They all reproduce at those temperatures too. And so, you know, you have to overlay that with, well, how is the oyster going to be impacted? And, you know, where is the relationship going to switch? Is it going to become a really full-blown parasitic because of climate change? I mean, those are the questions that, we don't fully know because no one has really investigated it yet. Yeah. How closely are each species of polychaete associated with each species? Because as you know, like, I mean, I know Eastern oysters and they do have a really wide range of tolerance and temperature and salinity. And so I would think that if a polychaete was really closely associated with the Eastern oyster, it would have the same broad range. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it should, right? Um, the, for the oyster, on the East Coast especially, um, uh, I guess you're talking about Chrysostria virginica, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we, the problem we have is Polydora websteri. Um, that's the one that infests the oysters on the East Coast. But the thing is, it's now become a problem on the West Coast. So they're reporting oysters in Washington also being infected by the same species. And we actually have an outbreak at those farms now. So yeah, I mean, it seems as though they can do well regardless. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really interesting. Oh, and then on the West Coast, the acidity in the polychaetes and the oysters, that's another whole level of climate change impacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, an, another question is, what you know scientists working with fisheries and in your case the the aqua 
the oyster growers or the shellfish growers. There were two different species there. What was that relationship like? Because sometimes it's really collaborative. Sometimes it's kind of a, you know, not <laughs> at all. Right, right. What was it like? And how did you gain trust? And, and so I was lucky in that I didn't have to gain the trust because all the politics was done by a master student in our, in our department. So he was the one that was working with the farmers. And you're, you're right, they withhold a lot of information. And in fact, when we figured out that um, it was the farmers moving the stuff around that was causing the observed genetic patterns, we actually had to hold off publishing that because, you know, we needed to either contact them, but we also needed to contact the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. Um, so the government to tell them, hey, this is what your farmers are doing, they're not supposed to be doing this. And so that was actually pretty contentious. Luckily, I had returned back to the US before any of that went down. So I'm not sure how that happened. All I know is I got an email that said, hey, you can start publishing this stuff now. Um, I also work with the Nantucket um, hatchery and they're actually very transparent. They have nothing to hide. Um, I'm actually, we're actually putting together a paper with one of their staff members. And, you know, I needed information on how they grow their stuff and they've been happy in, term, in terms of uh, giving me all that information. So it depends on the farmers and it depends on the industry. Um, the scallop farmers are pretty um, open to that stuff, only because the Nantucket scallop industry is very, there's a strong cultural tie right there. Right? So if they know that something is affecting their scallops, they're very happy in terms of giving out as much information as I can do with it. That brings up an interesting issue because scallop farming is becoming a hot topic in the Gulf of Maine mm. in Japanese lantern methods and there they're really well they start them young in a high density net and then they separate them the Japanese method they punch a hole and put them on these long lines oh, and then they're wow. separated by I don't know, like six inches apart or something like that. It'd be fascinating to know what was going on with any invasive species because they're relatively new aquaculture mm. and it's really considered a high value aquaculture because as lobster moves out of the Gulf of Maine, mm -hmm. scallops is an, they're like the next obvious place for a lot of lobstermen to go for their price point, you know, because mm -hmm. they're expensive. Yeah. Yeah, um, there is a, I forgot his name, I can't remember his name, but he's over at the University of Maine. Um, Rawson is his last name. Um, but his uh, his undergrad student actually found an invasive shell borer in a Maine scallop, I think. It was called Polydora onagolensis. Um, I was never found for in the United States. And so, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I didn't know that they were doing long line farming with those scallops. That's, that's yeah, and the in fact, um, some nonprofits and the state are really kind of promoting it yeah. as an alternative to a wild fishery. Um, hmm. Here's a question from one of our community. Uh, great topic, very interesting and informative. I am wondering how quickly the shellfish can adapt to the invasive species and how the makeup of shellfish might need to change to adapt you have any information about that? Yeah, I mean, so if you go into the wild um, and find an oyster, they might have one or two worms in them. Um, if you have one, two, three, even 10 worms in the shell, it doesn't seem to affect their growth rate um, or their tissue condition. The problem is when you have an outbreak and the video I showed you where there was like 250 worms in that single shell. So in that shell, you can see that the, um, if you were to look at the meat inside of it, there would be the condition index would be actually really, really low. And um, you can touch the shell and it would break apart because it's so brittle. And so, you know, they've done a good, they can adapt to low infestations, but the outbreak is what the problem is. And, um, you know, those worms are pesky because no matter what you try to do, it's very difficult to get rid of them. Um, one of the methods they do is like um, drying where they would pull the oysters and scallops and they would allow it to, you know, to, be, to be dried in the sun for a couple of hours and then put it back because the oysters can survive that. 
but the worms can too, because the worm actually secretes this mucus around its body, so it maintains its, uh, you know, its moisture even when the oyster is drying out, and so it can survive just as well as the oyster can by doing that. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Here's another question from one of our community members. Um, it's actually kind of. I this is an interesting question. Uh, fascinating talk with snails that can potentially climb over terrestrial barriers to other bodies of water, like the dam, climbing over the dams, maybe. How do you factor that into calculations of habitat connectivity and um, range expansion? And he studies invasive amphibious fish, snakeheads. He's curious how to quantify or predict that. Yeah, so for these snails, um, you know, for these are the, these are sometimes called the mystery snails, um, the pirate the snails. These actually don't, um, luckily, these don't move that far or, or um, they are able to move over dams, but they've been shown to survive the, they've, they've been shown to survive the gut of Canada geese. And we have kind of geese that feed on the tiny, tiny snails as soon as they come out. And people have looked at gut contents and they found live snails. And so overland dispersal by a birds is something that, you know, we're very, I, well, I'm not worried about it, my thesis, my PhD students, are, but, you know, she's trying to figure out how to um, account for that. Right, so it's gonna have to be looking at fine scale structure, really. Um, luckily, we, we have the hydrodynamic modeling that can work. But yeah, that's a that's a good question. So for for you know for that type of weird and orthodox species, yeah, I'm not sure how we'll how we'll tackle that, but um, it's definitely a possibility. That's great. Well, thank you so much for answering our questions. Lots of great ones. Appreciate your time so much. Um, so just to let everyone know, we record these talks and we put them on our Shoals live stream page, and that's at shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. Um, please feel free to share this with anyone who was not here tonight. Our next speaker is on July 15th at 7.30. Vicki Valkyz uh, is a graduate student at the Pacific Shark Research Center at San Jose State University. Her graduate work focuses on the spatial and temporal distribution of soup fin sharks in San Francisco Bay. She also does a lot of science communication uh, work and perhaps some of you recognize her name from Shark Week where she has shown up many times. Um, she's gonna talk to us about deep sea sharks. So we're going from invertebrates to sharks. Um, all of the information about all of these talks and everything we're doing this summer is on our website. Thank you, Dr. David, so much for spending the evening with us. We appreciate it greatly. And take care, everyone. Have a great night. And hope everyone does well in uh, the rainy weather that's about to hit the East Coast <laughs> or hitting the East Coast right now. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night.